Welcome to worship at North Bethesda United Methodist Church. My name is Reverend Kara and I'm the pastor here, not the preacher today though. Today we're blessed with the message of our own beloved Reverend Angela Wells, who's offering a reflection on the story of Jesus' post-resurrection appearance to his disciples and especially to Thomas. Next week we'll begin a new sermon series about creation care. It's called Holy Ground, and it'll take us all the way from Genesis toward Pentecost, which we'll celebrate on the first Sunday in June. One other event to be aware of is a meal packing day of service that we're hosting here in our fellowship hall this coming Saturday, May 7th. You can sign up for a shift to help set up tables or to get in an assembly line and pack emergency meal kits. We hope to pack over 10,000 of these meals, which we'll give to Rise Against Hunger, an organization that sends emergency meals to people experiencing hunger around the world. And it's an exciting time to be a part of our church, to be a part of what God is doing. And so I'm so glad that you've taken the time to join us today and to learn and to listen and to be welcomed by a God who loves you so. Welcome to church. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Upon the mountain, our Lord spoke. Out his mouth came fire and smoke. All around me looked so shine. My Lord, if all was mine, yes, yes every, every time, time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, yes every, every time, time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Jordan River runs right cold, chills the body, not the soul. But one train on this track runs through heaven and right back. Yes, yes every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Today, for a moment for all God's children, I'd like to read the book called I Wonder, and it's by Annika Harris and illustrated by John Rowe. I wonder. Eva loves to look for the moon. It follows her from place to place, disappearing behind trees and mountains, and then appearing again someplace new. Look, Mama, there it is. The moon looks so beautiful in the sky. How do you think it follows us, Eva? Eva thinks about it, but she just can't figure it out. It's okay to say I don't know, says her mother. When we don't know something, we get to wonder about it. I wonder if the moon and the earth are friends, says Eva. Her mother smiles. I like that idea. But mama, how does the moon really stay close to us? There is an invisible force called gravity that pulls all the things in the universe together. Eva's mother explains. Gravity keeps the moon close to the earth and it keeps the planets close to the sun too. They circle around like this. Eva understands a little better, but then she starts to wonder, Mama, where does gravity come from? I don't know, Eva. Nobody really knows for sure. And when no one knows the answer to something, it's called mystery. A mystery is something for everyone to wonder about together. 
How fun! Eva imagines herself wondering about gravity together with all the people in the world. Eva watches the moon disappear behind the clouds as she walks, excited to see where it will appear next. How many grains of sand are on the, in the whole world, Mama? I wonder about that too. There are trillions and trillions of grains of sand, but nobody knows exactly how many. Eva tries to think about all the sand in the whole world. It feels so big that I can't fit it all in my imagination. It makes me feel dizzy like I'm falling. I know what you mean, her mother agrees, and I'm sure other people feel that way too. Eva walks down another path looking for the moon and a little orange butterfly appears. Then she notices there are butterflies everywhere. Mama, where did all these butterflies come from? These butterflies have been flying around for a few days, but they started out as little caterpillars. And those caterpillars came from eggs and those eggs came from other butterflies. There are cycles all around us with one thing ending and another beginning. Things are always changing. Can you think of other things that change? Hmm, clouds and frogs and me. Later, Eva wonders, Mama, what was here before all the butterflies and frogs and clouds before everything? I don't know, answers her mother. It's another mystery. I like trying to imagine what was here before the beginning of everything. What do you think was here? And Eva says, smiling, I don't know. She thinks about it for a long time and then she has an idea. I wonder if there were feelings. As she walks home, Eva sees the moon again, glowing brightly above the roof of her house. Let's go inside and look for the moon through the window. We live with some big mysteries. When we come upon one, we're given a little gift. Every mystery is something for all of us to wonder about together. What do you wonder about? Today in our Bible lesson, we get to hear about one of Jesus's friends named Thomas. Now Thomas has some doubts, and that's another word for having some questions. Thomas had lots of questions, and he brought all that, those questions, all that sense of curiosity to Jesus and wanted to see for himself. And Jesus welcomed his questions. So however many questions you have, um, big and small, each and every day about how the world works, about how people are, about how um, anything in all creation is, bring those questions to God. God's wonder is big enough for all of our questions, all of our doubts, and all of our wonderings together. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for questions. Thank you for the sense of curiosity and wonder that fills our hearts and minds and imaginations. God, help us to imagine your love ever more clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Again, I'll be sharing from the New International Version of the Bible. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, when the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Oh, Thomas, doubting Thomas, as he's often called. I've always felt for Thomas, personally. He gets a bad rap, and for what? For refusing to go along with what everyone else is saying. He wants to experience the risen Christ for himself, something Mary and the other disciples have already gotten a chance to do. You gotta wonder where he was when everyone else saw Jesus. Did he draw the short straw and get sent out to bring home dinner? Had he just stepped out for a moment of fresh air? Whatever it was, he missed out through seemingly no fault of his own. It's not exactly like the resurrected Christ had scheduled his appearances ahead of time. It's also worth noting that this wasn't Jesus's first appearance. That very morning, Jesus appeared to Mary and Jesus sent her to tell the disciples and guess what? They didn't believe her. And now they're so offended when Thomas doesn't immediately take their word for it. Thomas's reaction is no different than the others. They didn't believe it until they saw Jesus for themselves and neither does Thomas. Thomas is clear that he got a raw deal. Is he really so wrong to want to experience the risen Christ like, like the others? And now he finds himself the odd man out. Can't you just picture all the other disciples trying to convince him? We saw Jesus, really we did, Thomas. Why don't you believe us? But Thomas is adamant. Unless I see and touch the marks of the nails in his hands, I will not believe. As Glennon Doyle writes, blessed are those brave enough to make things awkward for they wake us up and move us forward. This is an awkward moment for sure. Thomas has drawn a line and refuses to be swayed under peer pressure. Sure seems like integrity to me. But to understand where Thomas is coming from, it's important to zoom out a bit and see the overall context of this scene. The very first few words of the passage are easily missed but important when it was evening on that day. What day? Easter day. 
You see, it's been two weeks for us since Easter Day. We've finished leftovers, put away plastic eggs, and gone back to school after spring break. But for Thomas and the other disciples, it's only been about 12 hours since Mary first discovered the empty tomb. A really long, really stressful, really confusing 12 hours. They have got to be exhausted, on edge, maybe even a little paranoid. After all, their leader had just been killed by the state in the most gruesome way possible. The disciples are terrified, cowering in a locked house. Now it's important to do a little aside here because we have to deal with how our Christian texts have been used in anti-Semitic ways for centuries. John writes that the room where the disciples were, were was locked for fear of the Jews. That's the translation in the NRSV, for fear of the Jews. But it's not a very good translation. Some scholars suggest Judeans or Jewish authorities would be a better translation, while others emphasize that it was actually the Roman Empire who crucified Jesus, not the Jews at all. The Roman Empire terrorized Jews and other occupied peoples. Crucifixions were used as scare tactics to emphasize the power of the empire and to dissuade anyone from even thinking rebellious thoughts. The disciples were rightly afraid. Their leader was just murdered and they might be next. But it wasn't the Jews that they needed to fear. And this haphazard translation has caused way too much harm over the millennia. It was the authorities whom they feared, religious and secular authorities, but especially the Roman authorities, as they are the ones with a propensity for violent displays of power. Okay, so it makes sense that the disciples are cowering in fear when Jesus first came to them. Valid. But then a week goes by after they saw Jesus. They've had some time to ease into this good news Surely it should be sinking in. The disciples who saw Jesus should be feeling a little more confident by now. But nope. Even after seeing Jesus for themselves, even after Jesus has gifted them with the Holy Spirit, even after they've tried to convince Thomas that Jesus is alive, even after Jesus has sent them out into the world to share the good news, a week has gone by and where are the disciples? behind closed doors again. It seems to me that it isn't just Thomas who's having a hard time believing this news that feels too good to be true. A week later, Thomas isn't the only one having a hard time. A week after they saw Jesus, the other disciples are still sitting on their hands, fretting over what to do next, unsure of themselves and certainly not yet taking up the mission that Jesus has sent them on. But into the midst of the disciples' fear, doubt, and insecurity, Jesus shows up again and again, not to chastise them for being afraid, but to meet them where they are. This is the same Jesus whose invitation has remained the same throughout the book of John. Come and see, he says time and time again. And here again, Jesus comes to the disciples, to Thomas, and offers a gentle invitation. Come, it's okay, Thomas. Come and see the nail holes in my hands, feel my side, experience resurrection for yourself. Do not doubt, or better translated, do not be unbelieving, but believe. With this simple invitation, Thomas immediately recognizes Jesus as Lord and God. He wanted to touch, to feel, but in the end, he doesn't actually have to touch Jesus to know. Jesus' invitation is sufficient. Come and see. 2,000 years later, the invitation remains the same. Jesus' voice echoes down the centuries, come and see. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That's us.
We're some of those who weren't there for the first resurrection appearances. We're Thomas. We missed out on the firsthand experience, and yet the invitation remains for us as well. Come and see. Come and experience the risen Christ for yourself. The late professor Gail O'Day, who taught for many years at Candler School of Theology in Atlanta, writes, Jesus comes again and again to these scared and confused disciples. The disciples have not warranted a second visit by Jesus, but they get one and a renewed gift of his peace. Thomas is given exactly what he has requested, a chance to see and touch Jesus for himself. Importantly, the story does not tell us that Thomas did touch Jesus because touching Jesus is beside the point. The point is Jesus' offer of himself over and over again to people who long to see him. With no questions asked, Jesus offers himself and gives the repeated gift of his presence and his peace. End quote. That's Easter grace, a gift we could never earn, the gift of Jesus' presence who shows up anyway again and again, meeting us in our places of fear and offering his gentle invitation, come and see. Thomas, as it turns out, is not a cautionary tale. Thomas models for us that it's okay to genuinely seek Jesus, to not be sure yet, to come and see for ourselves the new life that is conquering death all around us. So if you find yourself with questions, if you find yourself with doubt, if you find yourself wanting more, seeking your own experience of the risen Christ, you've come to the right place. For here in the stories of our faith, we meet Jesus. Here among a community of believers, seekers and doubters, we show up just as we are and trust that Christ meets us here and sends us forth with peace. I'm reminded of Frederick Beekner's words about doubt. He writes, doubt is the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. So bring your doubt, bring your questions, bring your sense of curiosity, of wonder, bring your fear, bring your deepest desire, Christ meets us where we are and continues to invite us to believe that life is stronger than death, that love is stronger than hate, that Easter isn't over yet. Jesus comes again and again to those who seek him. That's us. We're Thomas. Blessed are we who are brave enough to make things awkward, to ask for what we need to seek our own experience of resurrection to trust that Jesus will show up, not to chastise us for our doubt, but to meet us in our humanity. Come and see Jesus beckons us. May we heed his invitation. May we bring our doubt and yet believe.
Holy God, we continue to hold on to the celebration and triumph of Easter. As we look back over the past year, we realize that many of us can identify with Thomas's doubt. Can we be the church, the body of Christ, when we can't see the body gathered in our sanctuary? Yet Christ has helped us to realize his risen body that can't be confined by walls and is not diminished by precautions and social distance. As we make our gifts to you, we affirm the resurrection power that we have seen, and so we say again, Alleluia. In the powerful name of Jesus we pray, Amen. Tempted and tried, we are oft made to wonder why it should be. When we see Jesus 